and welcome to Talk Art. I'm Sally Rain, and I will be your host as we delve into the world of the artist and the art that's all around us. Talk Art is sponsored by the Silicon Valley Open Studios. During the first three weekends in May, hundreds of local artists open our studios to the public. For more information, maps, and dates, you can go to the website svos.org. Our guest for Talk Art, Lessa Bouchard, is a multimedia conceptual artist, and we will be discussing the four steps involved in creating a conceptual art play. So welcome, Lessa. Thank you so much for having me, Sally. Oh, I'm very interested to find out what is involved in conceptual art. Oh, um, well, conceptual art really starts with the idea, the concept. Right? So if you have an idea, that is going to then dictate the, material, the materials that you use, the medium. So um, sometimes, you know, um, if you are struck by an idea and it feels like it should be uh, danced, you know, if it's something right. to do with movement, you would create, uh, you would create a dance piece. If, if you are um, someone who is interested in sound, like John Cage, you know, his, right. his piece on silence, um, you would engage with sound and, and the materials there and express and explore the idea that way. So tell us a little bit about your background. How did you become a conceptual artist? Um, well, <laughs> I, my background originally is in, in theater. Mm -hmm. And um, as a kid, I worked at the Renaissance Festival. And, and that really gave me a strong, um, I guess, foundation in commedia, uh, which is a, a style of theater that is um, from the medieval times into the Renaissance, Italian and French troops would go around and there were these very strong archetypal clown characters uh -huh. that would sometimes make fun of uh, the big wigs of the day, you know? So it's, um, yeah, that's a, it's a fun uh, comedic style. And um, both myself and one of the partners that I've worked with most recently both have a very strong background in commedia, though she has a, her training is very French, in Moliere. <laughs> The Moliere is, uses that style. Um, and then uh, mine was a little more Italian, like say Dario Fo style. So it's interesting um, blending the two. So you start with an idea uh -huh. and you have a process around that. Why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, that varies a, a bit from, of course, from medium to medium. But in, in theater, um, I lean heavily on an improvisational background. and as mm -hmm. does Susie Danzig, who was um, one of the main collaborator collaborators in creating um, A Moment Unbound, which is the work that I think we're really focusing Unbound. on right now. Mm -hmm. well, you brought some images of your process. Let's take a look at those yeah. while you talk. OK, great. Um, so I was working at um, a bookstore downtown in Palo Alto, um, on University Avenue right around the time that Borders closed and had worked off and on in bookstores my whole life and had just moved to Silicon Valley and had an artist studio um, and a ton of books. None of the media equipment that I had had in grad school and no internet connection, but a ton of books. So I was thinking a lot about my relationship um, with those. And also this image that you're seeing is a photo from this box of stuff that was um, given to me by the friends of the Palo Alto Library. So uh, between my installation of swaying bookshelves, which you saw, um, well, here it is again, that's good. Um, so if we could stay here for a second. Um, the swaying bookshelves were uh, basically my initial thinking conceptually about the instability of text, the inherent instability of text, this book the Case for Books by Robert Darton came out in 2010 um, at the time that I created this installation. And so this really, um, his, ide his idea uh, is that text 
is inherently, uns information is inherently unstable. That our okay. relationship with information, how we communicate, has uh, consistently changed throughout the ages. And that each time there's a shift, there's a big shift, right. say from oral to written, uh, there's a lot of in cultural anxiety. Oh no, it's the end of culture as right. we know it. Um, and then there is a shift from writing to print. Of yes. course, that was very dramatic, caused all kinds of upheaval throughout the very, this is why we have the Protestant movement, you know, I mean, it's because of the advent of print. Um, and then, of course, moving into the 20th century, you have the mass market paperback, which right. actually dramatically um, affected how we perform in the, in the theater. You know, um, Stanislavski's uh, methods of performance were easily accessible to everyone. Previously, that knowledge was reserved for guilds and families. There were family troops right. that went around exactly. and performed. But all of a sudden, you could get a, an affordable book that gave, these, gave you these secrets. Right. So um, should you, you know, there have been massive shifts each time. Um, you know, there's a change in the technology of how we exchange information. So of course now as we're shifting from the analog to the digital, we're th you know, thinking, oh no, what's right. going to happen? And there are some legitimate concerns, obviously, with, so you, you know. With the idea, you go into then what you call creative research. Yes, so that's and part, that's your box that's of, part stuff. of what this really is. It's been an ongoing exploration. The hanging bookshelves, which sway, you know, yes. um, and then the stuff found in the books donated to the Friends of the Library. Where did those come from? Those really ha came from books? Yes, so these are all pieces of material that were found in... Um, that people left there. Yeah, in the books donated to the Friends of the Library. Oh, interesting. And in fact, I have just purchased this Wallace Stegner that happens to have a letter from Wallace Stegner to the person that had previously owned this book. Oh my goodness. So what, they it left is, it in there. Yeah, they just they stashed it in here and what I what I'm assuming happened is that, you know, the previous owner probably passed away and the books were donated and nobody ever knew that the letter wow. was here. Yeah. So there are all kinds of things like that. Okay. I found one letter um, from it was a book about Shakespeare uh, and the law. And I pulled out this letter that was in this book, and it was from the author to Professor Gunther at Stanford. I looked at the name and I said, Jerry Gunther, I know that name. One of the fellow artists at Coverly. Wow. It was from her husband's library. It was one of his former students. He, te he taught constitutional law at Stanford. So there were all these it, really fascinating little um, special moments. It was really exciting for me to go back to her and, and say, how hey, did, how did that contribute piece. to your research for this piece then? So, okay, so as you know, we were finding these lovely things in this box and finding things ourselves at, at the library, um, I, I applied to Fool's Fury in San Francisco. It's an ensemble theater company. I had been doing drop in workshops there. And um, they had a play development series. I suggested that I had this box of stuff and these swaying bookshelves and, uh, you know, this character work that I had done in the past, performance art character, and these friends that agreed to sign on and collaborate right. with me. And they said yes. So they gave us the opportunity to try out some of uh, the, the work that we were generating from, you know, uh, there was one, one of the books that we found was, uh, from the Jersey Shore, and it just so happens that Susie Danzig is from New Jersey. It was just one <laughs> of these random kind of interesting serendipitous coincidences, and also there's this lovely Lucy the Elephant postcard. postcard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the Lucy the Elephant here from, from New Jersey. Uh, um, so, you know, these little bits and pieces started to work themselves into the world of this play. We came up with the, the swaying bookshelves and all of this ephemera became the world archive where these archivist sisters are sorting through things and trying to decide what to keep and what to let go of and 
uh, you know, some of it is rather absurd because mm -hmm. making those decisions can be so overwhelming and it gets at, you know, um, all kinds of ideas about, you know, with contextualization, you know, right. like finding this letter in this particular book, if I take that letter out, Right, it's it not nearly as much It doesn't have the meaning. same meaning, right? right? So context, you know, what does it mean to um, move right. things? So as part of the grant proposal that you uh -huh. received, then you went about and you sort of did parts of the right. play. Right, so that what they were gave us was the opportunity to perform pieces of what we were writing and try them out in front of an audience That's in San excellent. Francisco at the No Space and then uh, twice. First, you know, we did the first 15 minutes, and then we did another 15 minutes, and then um, about six months into the process, we did the whole first act at the ACT. So you have some images shop. of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we have just some a little bit of documentation, documentation. of the mm -hmm. process. So if we could, so yeah. So that's us um, workshopping Evan Michael. Sh uh, Michael Kokila Schumacher um, and myself at the Dragon Theater um, workshopping along the way because then when the Dragon heard uh, that we were doing this uh, process in San Francisco, they n were familiar with myself and with Susie's work, work at the time and uh, they were just starting their second stages series so they gave us a deadline which mm. was amazing, a, a spot in their second stage series. So here we are at the No Space, um, trying out, you know, uh, the archivist characters, sorting through books. And um, I think there, yeah, there's Susie with, there's a sprite actually, a book sprite behind the bookshelves, uh, you know, sort of giving her a little clue, helping her find things. And that's myself as uh, Ella at the no space. And so this is a little bit of a collage of the various writers that um, were involved in the process. So that's uh, Evan, myself, Susie Danzig, and Joyce McClure. And there are a couple of other uh, collaborators that aren't pictured, but that gives you a little bit hey, of And stuff. you have a video mm -hmm. that shows some of this. Yeah. So let's watch that too. So this is, this is actually documentation from a performance at the Meridian Gallery in San Francisco. You can do this, or that, or you can do the other thing. And you can see there we're, we're, we have the masks, but we haven't developed the whole costume yet. And there are writing prompts where we are interacting with the gallery audience and, you know, setting up bits of, of ephemera and they're interacting with the material. And the costumes are book sprites. Mm -hmm. So it looks like you're conducting. Right. So we're playing with the audience and playing with the text and chance operations. Uh, sort of an, an exploration of culture, you know, and our the world around us. So right. I love that that's part of your introduction to the show. And, you know, it's interesting to me, too, that um, it's really an um, an homage to Alison Knowles did a piece called Newspaper Music back I think in 2009 and it was really she was conducting uh, people reading from various newspapers from around the world and it was right at a time when we were really starting to be concerned about that physical newspaper and right. seeing the you know the decline in subscription rates and and the transition to digital is already you know was underway and so now this is sort of a, the next step, thinking about this in terms of books as well. So the result mm -hmm. of all of this mm -hmm. is what? It was the, uh, the play, A Moment Unbound, which we performed at Dragon Theater. Is it a full length play? Mm -hmm. It was a full two act play oh, wow. that, that we performed, this is 90 minutes. Um, and I have a kind of a trailer of the documentation from the show uh, that we can watch. Yeah, yeah, let's take a look at that. I moved them. They
They go over there. <laughs> well, this is the unbound center and the ephemerarium. You have to ask. Oh, did you find it? What you let go? Did it find you? Lovely. Thank I you. love the costumes <laughs> and the masks are phenomenal. Thank you so much. So tell us a little bit about the creation of the masks and how that all works in with the play itself. Sure. It seems like there's lots of bits and pieces everywhere. Yes. <laughs> and they're <it's>. all brought <laughs> together in the play. Yes. Fascinating. So um, we, when we were um, working out what the world was with the swaying bookshelves, and it suggested something not quite real and um, that had sort of a, a fantastic uh, sense to it. You know, the, um, the woods started creeping in. You know, there's an, uh, yeah, a lot of uh, imagery there with this, you know, this overgrown, the sense of an overgrown and wild library, right. you know. Um, and so um, I had had this dog woman character that I had, you know, been looking at um, being hidebound, you know, thinking about the these conflicting, you know, the, the, the animal self versus the body versus the mind kind mm -hmm. of right. idea. And so um, that character transformed into these book sprites, these wild creatures that uh, are made up of book and uh, light and electricity. Right, that so they're book lamps that they're, are on yeah, their heads, yes. like antennas. Right, right, so you can like see. That. They're almost. Um, so yeah, these guys right here. So that's a book light. And um, it's attached to uh, basically what our designers uh, did our fabricators because we all work together to really right. design these creatures um, is a mask and a fez which I think is particularly <laughs> <laughs> wild so because we wanted something that had um, a, a sort of a, a quick 
headpiece that right. could be taken on and off and that had the um, the quality of uh, the maybe the commedia spirit that both Susie and I are accustomed <laughs> to working with. So this this mask feeling um, really just spoke to us. And so we have these masks and then um, we wired them together and this the wire that we have actually um, incorporated into the masks is actually electrical wire from the Coverly uh, studios <laughs> where you work? The Coverly studios where I work oh, because my goodness. they just happened to be changing out the electrical oh, system. Goodness. So I salvaged a ton of electrical wire um, and so we worked it into the design of these of these creatures. Um, and so we wired everything together and cut them, cut the fez down so it was more of a hat. Uh, wire, hot glue, layers and layers of uh, various kinds of felt and um, And you actually material. used old books. And we actually used old books um, recycled from uh, the Friends of the Library recycling bins. And uh, like this is an old French dictionary, appropriately enough, uh, since <laughs> uh, Robert Darton is a French scholar, so I thought that was kind of there nice homage yes. to him. So, and many, many old legal books, too. <laughs> so it sounds like you take a lot of symbols and wrap yeah. them around each other and mm -hmm. put them together yeah. into your concept. Absolutely. And, and you know, I was thinking a lot about um, Egyptian mythology as well, Thoth. The, um, the god of, of knowledge mm -hmm. and writing is that the, oh, yeah, uh, the Ibis. Long. So I was thinking about the long nose. So my character, Jump, has, has a little bit of a longer nose, whereas um, Susie's character, Vertigo, is a little, a little stubbier. Some of that was, I, I wanted to go with the really long um, snout, but ended up thinking, you know, it sort of got in the way of right. our speaking. Um, but it's definitely part of the exploration and oh, yeah. uh, um, the building up of these characters. Yeah. So what's next? So um, in the process of doing this, uh, we also interviewed people. And one of the amazing coincidences that happened was this, um, this reference librarian that I met at the Library of Congress last year who happens to share the name of one of the characters from the play, Thomas, Thomas Mann. So we had drawn an, an article, a newspaper clipping out of our box that had a review of one of Thomas Mann's books, right? Right. Not this a Thomas Mann. Yes, was the, a German the, playwright. The, well, he wrote The Magic yeah. Mountain and, right. yeah, exactly. But this, this Thomas Mann uh, was a reference librarian at the Library of Congress for 33 years. He has since retired, but he is the author of the Oxford Guide to Library Research, and he agreed to give me a little interview And last the purpose year. of this is to create? To create a documentary uh. about uh, but perhaps a documentary series about some of the issues that we explore in the world of the play. So it's sort of a dramaturgical uh, look at those themes. So thinking about what our relationship with books and media is. Now. Well, let's watch part yeah. of that interview now. Yeah. One of the themes I, I refer to several times in the book is um, researchers nowadays are so often in the situation of the six blind men of India who tried to describe the elephant. You know, one guy grabbed the leg and said, the elephant is like a tree. Somebody touched the wall or the side. The elephant is like a wall. Somebody grabbed the tail. You know, the elephant is like a rope. When you do internet searches, you're always in that position. You're getting something quickly, but you don't know what you're not getting. You can't see how many other parts there are and how the parts fit together. And that's where research libraries give you a major uh, advantage in trying to get an overview of the shape of the elephant. Uh, we were talking earlier, I was helping one of the scholars back here who was doing a project on human rights in Islam. And if you do a, a search just in the library's online book catalog, forget the newspapers, the journals, the dissertations, the conference papers, just books, you get over 500 books on that. And you know, who can read 500 books? But through other search mechanisms available in a library, you could cut it down to size very quickly. Specifically right out here in the main reading room, we had three encyclopedias on Islam. 
and all three of those had an article on human rights. We had two encyclopedias on human rights, and both of those had an article on Islam. So there were five different overview articles right off the bat, and just the content of the articles was such that it gives you some reasonable assurance you're not overlooking something really important right to begin with. But equally important, maybe more important, all five of these encyclopedia articles had a concise bibliography, you know, a, a short list of highly recommended sources, not a printout of everything. And if you compare all five bibliographies, they all overlapped in recommending one particular book. And three of them overlapped in recommending a second book. Three of them overlapped in recommending another book. And there were at least, I think, five others that were recommended by at least two of the bibliographies. So instead of having 500 books to read, you've got a way to cut it down so you've only got a handful of the ones that you really want to start with. You cannot do that with Wikipedia. You cannot get a comparative perspective. You only get what's there, and you don't know where that came from in Wikipedia. I don't, I don't want to badmouth Wikipedia. It's very useful in many situations. But for scholarship, um, you can't quote it because the article may be very different, you know, a month from now from what it is today. And you you don't know what again you're what you're not getting which a comparative perspective which is easily available in a good research library um, can tell you fantastic i really look forward to seeing this documentary on from the idea to the conceptual research the play and then a documentary about it all thank you i it was it's i'm looking forward to uh, to working more with that material and to continuing to interview people. And there have been wonderful participants from the community um, who had great support from Bell's Books and Palo Alto. Thank you Thank so, you much, so much, much being for, on Talk Art. Thank really you for having me. It. I appreciate it. Thanks.